Hello, I'm Ataberk and today I'll talk about quark TRNG, high throughput true random number generation using quark throughput of activation in real DRAM chips. This work was done by researchers from ETH3, Tobey University of Economics and Technology, and University of Toronto. I'll start with a high-level summary of our work. DRAM-based true random number generators can provide low-cost true random number generation to a variety of computing systems. However, Prior DRAM-based TRNGs cannot provide low latency and high throughput to random number generation, as these TRNGs either sample fundamentally slow physical processes or cannot effectively harness entropy from DRAM rows. Our goal is to develop a high throughput and low latency TRNG that can be implemented using commodity DRAM devices. We make the key observation that a carefully engineered sequence of standard DRAM commands can activate four consecutive DRAM rows in quick succession. We call this new phenomenon quadruple activation. Our key idea is to use quark operations to simultaneously activate DRAM rows that contain conflicting data to generate random values on DRAM size amplifiers. We develop quark TRNG, which repeatedly performs quark operations and post-processes the results using a cryptographic hash function to generate true random numbers at high throughput and at low latency. We evaluate quark TRNG's throughput and quality using 136 real DDR4 chips from 17 DDR4 modules. Our results show that quark TRNG can achieve up to 5.4 gigabits per second throughput per DRAM channel, outperforming the state of the art by 15 times for base and 1.4 times for throughput optimized configurations. Quark TRNG generates true random numbers with low latency. We use the standard randomness tests developed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology to measure the quality of quark TRNG, and we show that it's a high quality to random number generator. Here's an outline of this talk. I'll briefly discuss why we need DRAM-based true random number generation in current computing systems. High quality true random number generation is critical to many applications, such as cryptography, scientific simulations, and machine learning. True random numbers can only be obtained by sampling random physical processes, and unfortunately, not all computing systems are equipped with dedicated TRNG hardware. This greatly limits the application space supported by these systems, and it weakens the security guarantees provided by such systems. DRAM is commonly used as main memory in a wide range of computing systems. TRNGs based on DRAM enable true random number generation within DRAM chips. DRAM-based TRNGs are particularly useful for supporting true random number generation in constrained systems, as they can be implemented at low hardware cost. DRAM-based TRNGs can also provide true random numbers at high throughput, which can open the application space in computing systems that lack dedicated TRNG hardware. DRAM-based TRNGs are synergistic with processing and memory systems in particular. FIM systems typically perform computation directly within a memory chip, which improves the overall system performance by avoiding unnecessary data movement. True random number generation within DRAM enables PIM workloads to sample true randoms directly within the memory chip and avoids inefficient communication to other possible off-chip TRNG sources thereby enhances the overall security and privacy of PIM systems. I'll go over the relevant background on DRAM organization and operation in the next few slides. A processor's memory controller communicates with a set of DRAM chips within a DRAM module through a memory channel. Each DRAM chip contains multiple banks that share a common chip I.O. interface. DRAM banks are organized into subarrays that consist of a set of word line drivers and sense amplifiers. Subarrays are partitioned into DRAM mats, which are collections of DRAM cells that are separated from each other by word line drivers. DRAM cells are laid out onto a two-dimensional array of word lines and bit lines within a DRAM mat. A row of DRAM cells is referred to as a DRAM row. Here's a simplified diagram of a DRAM cell. Now we will look at how we access this DRAM cell. This is a diagram showing you how a DRAM cell is connected to a sense amplifier. Inside a cell, there are two components. The capacitor stores data, and the access transistor determines if the cell is being accessed. The access transistor is controlled by the word line, which is enabled to connect the DRAM cell to its bit line. The bit line body is essentially the inverse of the bit line. The DRAM sense amplifier has an enable signal, which determines if the sense amplifier is currently active. Initially, both the access transistor and the sense amplifier are disabled, and both ends of the sense amplifier are maintained at half PDD. In this example, the capacitor is fully charged. To access the cell, we first enable the word line, which connects the cell to its bit line. 
Since the capacitor has a voltage level higher than the bit line, the charge starts flowing from the capacitor to the bit line, resulting in the bit line voltage to deviate slightly towards VDD. When we enable the sense amplifier, it will compare the voltage levels of bit line and bit line bar and amplify the deviation until bit line voltage reaches VDD. Since the capacitor is still connected to the bit line, the amplification process also restores the charge in the capacitor. Let's now look at how DRAM operates at the scope of a single subarray. Because memory controllers typically access DRAM cells in the granularity of a cache line, we combine consecutive DRAM cells to form cache lines in the diagram. On the bottom, we have a timeline of DRAM commands. First, we activate the first row to copy its cache lines to the sense amplifiers. At this point, we can read data in cache line granularity from the sense amplifiers by sending read commands. To access another row, we must first precharge the DRAM bank, which closes the open DRAM row and sets the bit line voltage to half VTD. We can now activate the second row before we read data from it. To ensure correct operation, we must obey certain timing parameters that define intervals between DRAM command pairs. Two important timing parameters are TRS and TRP. TRS is the time required for the charge to become restored in the capacitors on the open row. TRS dictates the amount of time we need to wait between successive activate and precharge commands. TRP is the time it takes for a bit line to become precharged to half VDD such that a new activate command can be issued to open a DRAM row. Successive precharge and activate commands must be separated on the command bus by at least a TRP amount of time. Now I will introduce quadruple activation. We observed that a valid sequence of DRAM commands can activate four consecutive rows in quick succession in real DRAM chips. We call this new phenomenon quadruple activation, and we refer to it as quark. To perform a quark operation in a DRAM chip, we first send an activate command. Then we send a precharge command that greatly violates the TRS timing parameter. Instead of waiting for the default 35 nanoseconds, we wait for less than 3 nanoseconds. We follow this up with another activate command, this time violating the TRP timing parameter. In doing so, we are able to open four DRAM rows with just two activate commands. We identify two characteristics of quark operations. First, quark can only activate the set of four rows whose addresses differ only in their two least significant bits. Here's an example. This diagram shows the organization of a set of rows in a subarray at a high level. Quark can only activate a set of four rows with the same color such as rows 0 through 3, or rows 4 through 7. However, Quark cannot activate any set of rows that are differently colored, such as rows 2 through 5. Second, Quark must activate the rows with addresses that have their two least significant bits inverted. Here we use the same color to highlight the least significant two bits in row addresses that can be targeted by activate commands to perform Quark operations. When the first activate targets row 0 and the second activate targets row 3, we observe valid quark operations, as the least significant two bits of these two addresses, 0 and 3, are inverted. Similarly, when the first activate targets row 2 and the second activate targets row 1, we observe valid quark operations. When we are using these two address combinations, the order of the activate commands do not matter. However, these are the only combinations of addresses that can be used to perform quark operations. We conduct experiments using our DRAM testing infrastructure, which I will talk about more in the upcoming slide, and we observe valid quark behavior on 136 real DDR4 chips from 17 DRAM modules. To explain how quark might be supported in current DRAM devices, we develop a hypothesis. Our hypothesis is based on the use of hierarchical word line schemes. These schemes are adopted in current DRAM architectures that have high density and high performance requirements, as they enable high density and low latency DRAM operation. In the hierarchical word line scheme, a master word line potentially drives multiple local word lines. We will look at an expanded view of a DRAM map along with the word line drivers it's attached to. The master word line drivers attached to either sides of a DRAM map drive the master word lines. Local word line drivers drive the local word lines that enable the access transistors in DRAM cells. These local word line drivers are enabled with a combination of a master word line and a certain control signal denoted at S0 through S3 in this diagram. Next, we will look at how the DRAM row decoder might be setting these control signals to enable quark in real DRAM chips. Our hypothetical decoder operates on the least significant two bits of the row address signal to set the control signals that drive the local word lines. The decoder logically operates in two steps. First, it predecodes the least significant two bits to form certain intermediate signals. 
Then it combines these intermediate signals to drive the control signals. The predecoder outputs the listing between two address bits along with their inverses and matches these signals. The row decoder combines the intermediate signals using two input AND gates. We will now see how an activate precharge and activate command sequence that we issue to perform clock operations enable all four control signals S0 through S3. We first issue an activate command to row 0, which sets the latches that drive A0 bar and A1 bar. This in turn enables the S0 signal, which is set by the bitwise AND gate that operates on these two intermediate signals. The AND gates that drive S1 and S2 have partially set inputs, however since A0 and A1 are not yet enabled, these gates do not drive their corresponding control signals. When the first activate command is executed, this decoder drives a single local word line. Following the first activate command, we send a precharge command while greatly violating the TRAS parameter. The precharge command cannot disable these two latches as there is not enough time due to violate the TRAS. We then quickly send another activate command as we greatly violated the TRP timing parameter, this time to row 3. This interrupts the precharge process and the latches that drive A0 bar and A1 bar remain enabled. Then the listing between two bits of the addresses are set to 1, which enables the latches that drive A0 and A1. Since all the intermediate signals are driven, all bitwise AND combinations of these signals are also enabled. With the execution of the second activate command, the remaining three word lines S1 through S3 are enabled. This results in quadruple activation as all four word lines become enabled. Next, I will describe how we develop clock tiering based on clock operations. First, we will see how we generate random values in DRAM sense amplifiers using quadruple activation. I will describe this over an example. This diagram depicts a set of DRAM cells on the same bit line on four simultaneously activated DRAM rows. Initially, the even address rows are initialized with logic 1, and the other address rows are initialized with logic 0. The bit line and bit line bar is set to half BDD. The figure on the right depicts the difference in voltage between the two sense amplifier terminals over time. The gray dashed lines depict the reliable sensing thresholds that the bitline voltage needs to exceed for the sense of to correctly sense the values on the bitline. Since bitline and bitline bar are set to half VDD, the voltage difference is initially zero. We start by sending an activate command to row zero. This enables the word line and consequently the DRAM cell on row zero shares its charge with the bitline, raising the bitline voltage slightly above half VDD. Next, we send a precharge command, quickly followed by another activate command to row three. The second activate command enables the remaining three rows and keeps the first row open as it interrupts the precharge process. The sense amplifier is enabled soon after the second activate command. However, since the deviation on bitline voltage does not exceed the reliable sensing threshold, the sense amplifier amplifies the value on the bitline randomly due to noise originating from random physical processes, either towards VDD or towards minus VDD. You can refer to our paper for more details on how we use quark to generate random values on DRAM sense amplifiers. We exploit this behavior and develop a high throughput TRNG that leverages random values on the sense amplifiers generated by clock operations. We will look at an example on how clock TRNG exploits the high bit level parallelism in DRAM arrays to generate true random numbers at high throughput. Here's a set of four consecutive DRAM rows, which we refer to as a DRAM segment. Clock TRNG generates random values on the sense amplifiers in four steps. First, it initializes the DRAM segment using a predefined data pattern. In this example, we will fill the odd address rows with all zeros and even address rows with all ones. Second, it performs a clock operation to generate random values on DRAM sense amplifiers. At step 3, clock TNG reads the random values on the sense amplifiers to the memory controller. To do so, based on a one time characterization effort, which I will describe in the next slide, it partitions the data on the sense amplifiers into arbitrarily sized blocks with 256 bits of collective Shannon entropy. It reads each 256-bit entropy block to the memory controller and uses the SHA-256 hash function to post-process each block to finally produce a 256-bit true random number. Quark TNG generates a 256-bit true random number. For every one of these blocks, it reads from a segment. Now I will present our evaluation of Quark TNG's randomness characteristics, its quality and its throughput. We conduct a characterization study on 136 real DDR4 chips from SKINX. Our goal is to understand the randomness characteristics of the results of quark operations and to evaluate quark TNG. We use a modified version of SoftMC, 
a DDR4 memory testing platform that lets us issue arbitrary DDR4 command sequences with any set of timing parameters to DRAM modules. We use rubber heaters and a temperature controller to maintain the temperature of the DRAM chips during our experiment. We use channel entropy as a measure of randomness in which streams generated on DRAM cell amplifiers. Channel entropy is calculated using this formula and it can be interpreted as the effective number of random bits in a bit stream. To calculate the probability values in this formula, we simply find the proportion of logic 1 and logic 0 values in the random bit streams we test. To calculate the Shannon entropy for each bit line, we repeatedly perform clock operations and read the sense amplifiers 1000 times. The intuition here is that a bit stream full of repeating values, such as all ones, will result in zero entropy whereas a bit stream with an equal amount of zeros and ones will result in one entropy. We conduct a characterization study at 50 degrees Celsius and at nominal DDR4 voltage. We collect a thousand bit, bit streams from each bit line in 8000 DRAM segments using all 16 different 4-bit data patterns, where each bit in the data pattern corresponds to the binary value we use to initialize all cells in a DRAM row. For example, the 4 ones data pattern initializes each row with all ones, and the 1000 data pattern initializes the first row with all ones and the remaining rows with all zeros. We look at the cache block entropy to understand the effect of data patterns on the entropy resulting from clock operations. We calculate the entropy of each cache block as the sum of the entropy of all bit lines in that cache block in every segment we test. Based on cache block entropy, we define two metrics. The average cache block entropy is the average entropy of each cache block in a DRAM module whereas the maximum cache block entropy is the greatest cache block entropy in a DRAM module. On this plot, we display the cache block entropy on the y-axis over the data patterns on the x-axis. The blue bars show the average cache block entropy, and the red bars show the maximum cache block entropy. These values are averaged across all DRAM modules we test. The bars are clustered according to the DRAM pattern used in initializing the DRAM segments. The error bars show the range of the values across all modules, where the upper tick indicates the maximum and the bottom tick indicates the minimum value. Notice that the maximum possible value for cache block entropy is 512, as there are 512 bit lines in a cache block. We observe that the entropy varies with data pattern. We exclude the eight other data patterns that cannot induce significant entropy on DRAM sense amplifiers from this figure. We observe that the 0111 data pattern results in highest average entropy across all modules. Since the first row is activated slightly earlier than the other three rows, we hypothesize that when the simultaneously activated three rows are initialized with the inverse of the first row's data, the bit line voltage cannot exceed the reliable sensing threshold in most sense amplifiers, resulting in random values on these sense amplifiers. To see if entropy changes according to the physical location of a DRAM segment, we will look at each segment's entropy. We calculate the segment entropy as the sum of the entropy of each bit line in that DRAM segment. The maximum possible segment entropy is 64k, as there are 64,000 bit lines in a DRAM segment. We plot the segment entropy on the y-axis over the segment ID on the x-axis. There are three curves on this figure. The red curve shows the average segment entropy across all 17 modules, while the error bars show the range of the segment entropy across all modules. The dashed blue curve and the dotted black curve display the segment entropy for two selected modules, each representing a main entropy variation trend we observe across all modules. We observe that the segment entropy behavior changes from module to module. The entropy of the segment in the middle of the highlighted region behaves in an inverted way for the two modules. We also see that the entropy significantly increases near the end of the DRAM bank, around the 8000 segment. To summarize, here are the key takeaways from our analysis of entropy. We see that the entropy resulting from clock operations change according to the data patterns used in initializing DRAM segments and the physical location of DRAM segments. We attribute these to both systematic manufacturing process variation and design and use variation related effects. We conduct two experiments to evaluate quark TNG's random number generation quality. First, we collect one megabit bit streams from each bit line in every segment from multiple DRAM modules using quark. Second, we collect one gigabit quark TNG bit streams using high entropy DRAM segments from multiple DRAM modules. Our results show that bit streams generated by both quark and quark TNG passes all 15 NIST tests, and you can read the full paper for more details. We estimate quark TNG's throughput for a DRAM module according to this formula.
Here, SID is the number of SHA input blocks in the highest entropy DRAM segment. And L is the latency of executing one clock tier in iteration in nanoseconds. We refer to a contiguous range of cache blocks with 256 bits of collective Shannon entropy in a DRAM segment as a SHA input block. In this example, there are four arbitrarily sized SHA input blocks. We identify these blocks by rigorously characterizing DRAM modules for entropy resulting in clock operations. As an example, this figure plots the entropy of individual cache blocks in a high entropy DRAM segment. To identify a SHA input block, we find a set of contiguous cache blocks that have a total amount of 256 bits of entropy. We calculate L by tightly scheduling the DDR4 commands required to perform clock operations, and we multiply by 256 as each clock energy iteration outputs a 256-bit true random number. For our throughput estimation, we evaluate three configurations for clock TNG. The first configuration, MOM bank, uses a single DRAM bank. The second configuration, VGP, exploits the bank group level parallelism in DDR4 to parallelize DRAM commands required to perform clock TNG iterations. Clock TNG's third configuration, RC plus PGP, uses row clone to bulk initialize DRAM segments row by row in DRAM, and it exploits bank group level parallelism. We use the priorly proposed row clone operations to bulk copy data within a DRAM survey to reduce the overhead of initialization. We use activate precharge activate commands with reduced timing parameters to perform row clone operations in real DRAM devices. We plot the average, maximum, and minimum throughput calculated for each configuration across all DRAM modules. On average, Clock TNG provides 3.44 gigabits per second true random number generation throughput. Clock TNG's throughput is greatly improved by row clone, as it significantly reduces the overhead of initializing DRAM rows. Finally, we compare Clock TNG's throughput against two of the high throughput state-of-the-art DRAM-based TNGs. Among these two, D-Range exploits activation latency failures, and Talukers mechanism exploits pre-charge latency failures to generate random numbers on sense amplifiers. We calculate both of these mechanisms throughput by tightly scheduling the DDR4 commands required to induce timing failures. We augment both mechanisms by exploiting bank group level parallelism and by using row clone to bulk initialize DRAM rows. In our evaluation, we consider base version for each mechanism, where we evaluate them as they're proposed, and an enhanced, more fair version, where we characterize the entropy resulting from timing failures using 17 DRAM modules and use SHA-256 to optimize their throughput. In our evaluation, we assume a system which has 4-channel DDR4 memory. This plot shows the average throughput of timing failure-based mechanisms along with quark tier engine and 4-channel system. We project the throughput of prior work and quark tier engine to various DDR4 data transfer rates displayed on the x-axis. We conclude that quark tier engine outperforms the base version of the best prior DRAM-based tier engine by 15 times at a standard 2.4 gigahertz transfers per second DDR4 transfer rate and the optimized version of the best prior DRAM based TNG by two times at potentially a future 12 giga transfers per second data transfer rate. You can check our paper to find more detailed information, including results on clock changes quality evaluation using standard NIST random tests, throughput and latency comparison against four other DRAM TRNGs, excluding the range and Talukers mechanism, discussion on how clock TNG can be integrated into a real system, the throughput provided by Quark TNG while applications are running concurrently, the negligible area and memory costs of integrating Quark TNG, and an analysis on the sensitivity of entropy resulting from clock operations to temperature and passing time. I would like to wrap up with a summary of our work. DRAM based TRNGs can provide high throughput and low cost to random number generation to a wide range of systems. The problem with prior DRAM based TRNGs is that they're slow. Our goal in this work is to develop a high throughput and low latency TRNG that uses commodity DRAM devices. We observe that a sequence of DRAM commands can activate four DRAM rows in quick succession, which we refer to as quadruple activation. Our key idea in developing a high throughput DRAM based TRNG is to use quadruple activation to generate random values on DRAM sense amplifiers. We evaluate Quark TNG using real DDR4 chips and find that it achieves up to 5.4 gigabits per second throughput per DRAM channel and find that it provides random numbers at low latency. We compare Quark TNG against state-of-the-art DRAM-based TNGs and we show that it outperforms prior DRAM-based TNGs. We evaluate Quark TNG's quality using standard NIST randomness tests to show that it is a high quality to random number generator. Thank you for listening. And please read our full paper if you're interested in quark TRNG.